Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Broadcasting from the confines of an abandoned radio station in the secluded apartment building of high strangeness. From the foothills of the Colorado Rockies, it's time for full disclosure of the topics they told us were off limits. Hello there, I'm Connie Willis. This is Coast to Coast AM. Tonight, UFOs in the news and open lines. Time now to turn off those lights. Join me for another interesting evening of conversation. Much needed education and the chance that we might get a little closer to the truth of what lurks amongst us and what is beyond. I'm Connie Willis, and this is Coast to Coast AM. You are listening to Coast to Coast AM. Hello there. Connie Willis here. Fall is here. Wow. Lots of changes. Seeing the leaves turn colors. So nice. So nice. But... I still like summer and I still uh, have a lot more summer to do, so hopefully it won't be uh, too quick to winter. Anyway, uh, if you'd like to join me any other time outside of Coast to Coast AM, I hope you will by going to my website, ConnieWillis.com. At least sign up for my newsletter, but uh, you can sign up to go on live investigations of Bigfoot, hauntings, strange lights by uh, signing up for Blue Rock Talk. You can also be a part of uh, Connie After Dark, where you can have a drink with me. My podcast, I know, I'm bringing it back. Hang in there. I, I love when you say, hey, w what's taking you so long? That's good. That's a good sign. I like that. I appreciate that. And also my book, Win Any Lottery. You can check that out. You can learn all about it at ConnieWillis.com. That's where you use a pendulum taught by my buddy Lynn Buchanan, one of our psychic spies that comes in here and visits the show on Coast to Coast a lot of times. And he said, this is how you pick winning numbers with a pendulum. And uh, told me that in about, I don't know, 10, 2010, 2011. I said, can I do something with this? Yeah, go ahead. So put a book together and the method is out there and you guys are winning money. So I'm excited. You haven't shared it yet, but hey, keep winning it. That's all that matters. Just just, just let me know that you're still winning it. Again, that's at ConnieWillis.com. All right, our guest tonight, we have open lines later on, but our guest tonight, interestingly enough, he was on with me almost two years ago today almost it was halloween which is very close i'm that's amazing he must be sending me vibes along the way but you guys know him anthony sanchez he's been on coast to coast many many times you've seen him on ancient aliens and all sorts of other shows you know his book ufo highway now he's got a new one coming out guess what it's going to be launched on halloween uh, he He's one of the best marketers, one of the best writers, one of the best web designers. The man does everything, and he even has a little baseball history, and maybe sometime he'll he'll talk about that. I used to play baseball, the only girl on a, a guy's league for like seven, eight, nine years, something like that, and so it was fun to hear him talking about how far he got. So maybe we'll get that story out of him tonight. But since 1989, when Area 51 first captured the attention of everyone, Anthony has been into these He's been he's been fascinated by UFOs. He's been fascinated by a lot of things, by the way. He and I got to do a documentary together. It was really nice that he directed and produced. And uh, so he, he's been around a long time doing a whole lot of things, paranormal, UFO, all sorts of things. Let's go ahead and welcome him in. He's got an incredible background. I'll let him tell you more about his background because it gets into that Silicon Valley stuff that is very, very, very deep. However, he's deep into it, and I'm glad about that, Anthony, because you know your stuff. So welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. Thank you, Connie. I can't believe I'm actually back on the show uh, alive, number one, <laughs> because of what happened to me in 2019, which yes. I did not know about, but I was stricken with Guillain-Barre syndrome and spent six months in the hospital, completely paralyzed. 
And <sighs> I wasn't able to speak for two years. From August 2019, I, I wasn't able to speak. So this is kind of a miracle. So thank you, guys. Glad yeah. to hear you back. And it was just, you know, just in time, just in time for another book. <laughs> so your voice is right on time with your talents. Well, you know, one of the things that I have tried to do my entire life is to unlock the mysteries of the universe, whether it's in the paranormal or in the UFO, uh, you know, sphere. It's it's what I try to do. So I'm really excited to release this new book, UFO Nexus, and really what I'm doing is I'm touching on a lot of the recent UFO news that has come out and trying to shed light on a lot of the more enigmatic or, you know, mysterious areas of this news and and trying to just bring it to light and give an academic approach as to what it might be, what's happening. Now, most people already know you with the UFO Highway. Um, and they know you with ghost hunter apps because I've had you on just strictly with ghost hunter apps that you do. Right. A lot of paranormal work over the years, which uh, you've been involved with. So you know, that's, amazing. that's amazing in itself. And we did that documentary. And uh, that was a lot. What, of work. what year was that? When was that? A lot of the filming for that happened over, I want to say between 2015 to 2017. Wow. Yeah, it's been, it's been a while, but uh, what a great well, that, that turned out to be. That, that was all go- – tell people where they can see that. Well, if you go to uh, ghostcenterapps.com, there's a link for YouTube. When you click that link, it'll take you right to the video. There's, there's tons of videos that have to do with the Ghost Center apps, but the biggest one by far is the movie documentary uh, Open Minds – or uh, excuse me uh, – Ghost of uh, uh, open, open ghost mines. <laughs> years. Gotcha, gotcha. I know. That's why I threw it at you, so you would. Get... <laughs> but you know what? I I say it is about time. You know, once you get your next book launched, um, it's about time to do another documentary, and this time, UFOs, strange lights. Right, and, by the way, and by the way, it was haunted mines, the ghost box session. So we did that with Steve Nuff. Steve Huff, and uh, with Noreen and a whole bunch of other people, all of our good friends of the paranormal team that we assembled. And uh, that was six years ago. That was six years ago. It seems like it was longer than that. Yeah, I know. Wow. Wow. It's been forever. It's been forever. Well, in between there, you apparently passed away three times. You crossed over three times during that. uh... Right. So this is what happened. Um, This is craziest thing. In, in 2019, in August, I got a sinus infection. And instead of my immune system attacking the sinus infection, it chose to attack my nervous system. Oh. It, and, it, and it literally destroyed my nervous system. And that's called Guillain-Barre syndrome. And I was in the hospital within 48 hours of getting this infection. Lying on my deathbed, I, I literally, I had to have a tracheotomy. My lungs were no longer operating on their own. Uh, it was just a nightmare. And yeah, during the three months that I was in the ICU, I nearly passed away, like on three occasions. And uh, I honestly feel I, I delved into the other side. Did you and see the light? I saw a lot more than a light. Oh! <laughs> Tell us. Oh, wow. like, yeah, it's like literally I visited another world. It was just strange, like traveling through a portal. It was it was something that I I wrote about. I actually wrote a book called The Crossing that will be coming out later this year about the near-death experiences. And it was sort of a therapy. It was sort of therapy for me to write that book because so many, so many things happened during that time in my life. But I'm just glad to be back writing books, writing more software, and being involved with the world again. You know, it was hard to be paralyzed for two years and not able to speak for two years. And especially you, because you do not sleep. You are constantly working. Your mind is constantly going. The rest of you is trying to keep up with the mind because you work with uh, websites, web design, you build apps, you're constantly writing or producing or directing something. So 
And, um, and in, addition to, in addition to all of that, I have a day job as a software engineer at a company. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like so much going on. And by the way, kudos to my 18-year-old son at the time who ran my software company, company for me while, while I was paralyzed. You have an amazing yeah. son. Yeah, Sean, you remember Sean. He was with us. Uh, he was is there. beyond his years. Yeah, yeah. So thanks he, to him. And, uh, thanks to everybody uh, really, who really helped me during that time. How old is Sean now? Sean is now 23. Going on 45 or 50. He's just, <laughs> you know, he's just that way. Tell, Make sure you tell him I said hello. He's a good guy. Right. But you can just nail these facts, boom, 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 boom. And you really think you. from all perspectives. And you write like poetry. I mean, you do. It's like, man, how does he do this? In fact, you guys, when, when you hear... When you hear me first come on and end, he helped me write those intros and outros. That when I first came on the coast, I said, hey, what what do I do? What do I say when I first come in and first come out? And Anthony helped put that together. He put it together for me, and then I just kind of, you know, added my own little flair to it. But uh, right. uh, you, you're the guy. I mean, you're the writer that writes poetry. Right. And, Connie, it was so much better when you added your flair to it. Trust me. Oh, well, man, you gave me the heart. And then I just added a little soul. <laughs> right. And, you know, and I think, I think that, uh, like you, I choose to not be, I mean, unfortunately, I was paralyzed for two years, but I don't, I choose not to be an armchair researcher. If I can exactly. get out there to a site, I'm going to get yeah. out there. Yeah. I've been to Area 51 multiple times. I've been to Dulce, New Mexico multiple times. Mm-hmm. I mean, you name it, I've been there. So it's just. There's something different about actually physically being on site and, you know, the, the tactile nature of being able to pick up dirt, view the surroundings, and put together your own idea of what may have happened is super important. Well, I, that's what I think <clears throat> is shows in your writing because you take that analytical side, you take the, the – um, well, you take that side, but then because you also experience it, you're able to add in the other side that I appreciate so much. I understand the other. You got to do that. You know, that goes back to work for me and all the studies and schools and degrees, all that kind of thing. But but you also add that experience to it, too. Um, I went to Dulce twice. I'm trying to think. Is it twice or three times? And each time I would me and the other people with me, we were run out of Dodge. You Each know, time we you, took I, off. I, I've heard that before. So back in 2016, I want to say it was 2016, uh, Conspiracy Theory, the show with uh, uh, Governor Jesse Ventura was going to be yes, filmed he. there. And Sean Stone was part of that project. And they got run out of town. <sighs> And I mean, not from from the people, not from the people. Mm -hmm. It was, we got to get out of here. Something's telling us to run, (laughs) and we did. Right, right. So there's a lot of incidents reported by the people that live there in Dulce that there are unknown forces at work that are keeping people out of certain areas, obviously. But in that particular instance, the, the tribal government did not allow Jesse Ventura and them to film because they, essentially they just showed up. However, a co- and I was supposed to be a part of that, but I wasn't able to travel until a couple of days later. And by the way, a couple of days later, I got there. I met with Nancy Collado. Uh, she's a former tribal police officer. Her father was a, a president of the uh, tribal council. And these are friends of mine. And... Lo and behold, uh, Sacramento MUFON investigator Rick Prestel, who's one of my best friends in life, he and I were on top of the Archuleta Mesa with a private guide. Mm. When we found shipping containers for jet engines sitting oh. atop some sort of air vents Ooh. on top of the Mesa, that's when our guide freaked out and said, we got to get out of here. Don't touch anything. Two days later, I'm partially paralyzed in my face. I don't know what that is. Oh, yeah, interesting. Exactly. 
Yeah. Yes. Well, that's what happens with these events. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was, I went back to my hotel room and I literally felt like my skull was on fire. And I was, yep. I was dying. Just a, a strange, strange event. Yep. Yep. I saw something there. Um, uh, we, we, we definitely had something view us and really hurt our heads on, on the second occasion that I was there. Uh, the person that was driving, he had like, he went, ow, and, and dipped his head back because he had some just real sharp pain in his head. And I remember looking over at him and then boom, I got it. Ow. And because I had done uh, remote viewing with Lynn Buchanan, you know, our psychic spy buddy and, and uh, Lori Williams and all that, I knew that, that I was getting viewed by something. I actually ended up asking Lynn Buchanan, and I said, what was that? And he said, well, they just took a look at you to see what you were doing there. And, you know, when you can feel being viewed, not everybody feels that. Joe McMonagle had told me, he said, Connie, that's a gift. You don't think it's a gift, but that's a gift that you can feel that. And he's right, but I wish I had other gifts, you know, but I said, but, but I, it hurt. And sometimes people can view you and it feels good. And you're like, Oh, and, but you usually know who it is. This was really painful. It was, it was not human that my, it was not human. It was not nice either. Yeah. And that's when we were on our way out, but I had seen something that I'd never seen before. Tell me if you've ever seen this creature. Um, I was actually, it was the first time I was out there and it was with a cop who had a retired cop who had died twice in the line of duty. And, and the first time he died, he, uh, when he came back, he always had this Indian figure with him at all times, this chief, you know, he had the, uh, had the, uh, feather, uh, headband all the way down and always with him. And then the second time he passed, he still had the Indian chief, but he had a little alien with him and, um, and an angel, and I, I think it was three total uh, that were always around him. This guy was amazing when it came to um, psychic stuff. I mean, he was just absolutely amazing. Anyway, he and I both saw what looked like this crazy creature that was see-through and jello-like, and it was behind the vehicle coming up toward us from, from the left side and the right side, and both of he and I both t- Hook off. Currently, we have Anthony F. Sanchez with us tonight, writer of several books, UFO Highway, a new one coming out, UFO Nexus. We're going to be talking about that tonight. Um, also coming up, The Crossing, and you can find his books at strangelightpublishing.com. You can also find his Ghost Hunter apps that are absolutely crazy and amazing and spooky as well at ghosthunterapps.com. Uh, yeah, I'll never forget, Anthony, when you sent me some of those apps. This is when I was still living with my mom. And <laughs> you said <laughs> you wanted me to test it out. And I was trying to test it out with you on the phone. And you had said, don't do that in your home. <laughs> you don't want to know what's there. <laughs> well, you know, that's the, thing with, that's the thing with these paranormal apps is a lot of people don't realize you start using these these tools that act as mediums to invite spirits from the other side into your house, you're going to be stuck with them. And you're going to have to go through the whole process of a cleansing and all of that. So you got to be careful when you're, Hey, that'll be your, that's your next app. It clears. Oh, I don't know if I could do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause a lot of paranormal people, a lot of business come out to your house to do the cleansing for you and, (laughs) <laughs> Ask for an, 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 an honorarium or whatever. You know, but, well, then you yeah. have a follow-up that says, do you want them back? Here you go. Bring them back. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we'll work it. We'll work it. So, okay, UFO Nexus. Well, okay, right. give me, first of all, the difference of UFO Highway, that book, which was a huge hit and success, to your new one, UFO Nexus. So, in essence, um, UFO Highway was essentially – an incident where I interviewed somebody who said that they worked at the underground facility there at the, at the Archuleta Mesa and in, in adjacent areas. In, 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 in essence, working with gray aliens, reverse engineering technology, strong ties to Los Alamos National Laboratories. So it was very controversial. That's what UFO Highway was about. UFO Nexus is essentially looking at modern 
ufology. What are the UFO, UFO events that are happening in society today, and how do they relate back to historical events like Roswell, uh, Kecksburg, and all of these other famous UFO incidents? But really, the one thing that I touch on is the uh, UFO oversight from, from the Congressional Subcommittee Mm-hmm. Because it's really been 50 years. As in 1970 was the last time we had an official government oversight, uh, you know, a hearing on the subject of UFOs. And that was with the con- conclusion of everything that was taking place in the 60s from, like, Project Blue Book and whatnot. But this time we have David Grush, Brian Graves, David Fravor, all of whom provided testimony to Congress and the things that we learned are just stunning, uh, especially with the USS Nimitz, you know, the Tic Tac UFO, which you know, resulted from that. In 2004, uh, you know, the USS Nimitz, and in 2015, you had the Go Fast and the Gimbal videos, which emerged, of, you know, on the East Coast, of similar, you know, type crap, these UFOs that defy the laws of physics. So that's what the book touches on. And the other thing, too, is I also talk about the Las Vegas UFO and alien incident, which came out this year. Yeah, I like that. I can't can't wait to hear you talk more about that. Yeah. So, you know, that to me, that's going to stand out as something that is really intriguing because you have law enforcement officers who were involved and believed that they also saw something, not to mention the ambiguity uh, due to the fact that they shut off the, uh, the the body cam just as they were walking into the backyard where the family had reported uh, seeing the aliens. So I write about that. I offer, you know, my opinion, but I also look at the notable observations and findings. Like, for instance, the incident seems to align with a lot of global accounts of bizarre UFO and extraterrestrial encounters. And at the location of the alleged landing, there was a noticeable circular impression that was discovered in the soil. A lot of people said they managed to debunk that, but I don't know. Uh, the family reported experiencing a shock wave, and there was auditory evidence of multiple footage of uh, excuse me auditory evidence of multiple footsteps in their yard. Not to mention, they said they heard something on the roof, on the rooftop, and the father and the son who observed. Uh, the alien said that they saw lights attached to or protruding from the, their head area. Was it technology? Was it biological? We don't know. There's so much weirdness behind that. And the family's been threatened. They've been observed by strange groups of people. And uh, the fact that the Metro Police blacked out a segment of the body cam footage citing privacy laws, something we never see them do, uh, is just strange to me. I what mean, do you how, think how, that's how, about? How many videos on YouTube are there a body cam footage yeah. of entire incidents? Why is it the moment they were going to walk into the backyard where this incident occurred, where there was a craft, where there were it's purported aliens, they're citing privacy laws all of a sudden. So no, that that's just intriguing to me. Not to mention the fact that the there was a frantic phone call to nine one one. Uh, you know, the caller literally said, "Is it in my backyard?" I swear to God, this is not a joke. This is actually we're terrified. And then the dispatcher had said to him, "You're telling me that there's two people, two subjects in your backyard." And the caller said to her, "Correct." And they're very large. They're like eight foot, nine feet, ten feet tall. They look like aliens to us, big eyes. So, I mean, the the guy was actually terrified, as was the family. And, you know, George Knapp did some follow-up investigations out there for uh, KLS uh, KLS TV, Channel 8. And I believe they were the first ones to uh, acquire the body cam footage from the officers that were dispatched that night. And, uh, you know, I remember from the videos that I saw, the officer asked the kid, what did you see? And the kid responded, it was like a big creature. 
uh, more than 10 feet tall. And the officer told him, said, I'm not going to BS you guys, but one of my partners reported seeing something descend from the sky. Now, there was a meteor that was seen in the sky, but I mean, is it related? There was a, there was a nearby home in the area that had ring cam footage of something that had nothing to do with that meteor. It literally sounded like a stereotypical a UFO landing from a 1950s movie. You know, the sound of that <laughs> I remember but seeing that. Like, but with like a boom, and the entire yeah. neighborhood lit up. That's not a meteor. Uh, something happened in that neighborhood. And I think it's uh, one of the things that I wrote in the book is that the distance from Area 51 to Las Vegas is just 82 miles away. And that's just a little too close to dismiss entirely from the narrative of that evening in April 2023. Matter of fact, it was April 30th, and it carried over into May 1st. So, I mean, this is a very recent event. And, you know, a lot of people are laughing. A lot of people are joking. But you cannot make a call to 911 in the state of Nevada as a hoax or part of a hoax and not expect to be hit with a felony. It's a very serious thing. So the Las Vegas UFO and alien incident, I write about it in the book. And, uh, you know, I know I sent you a preview of the book. And uh, one of the things that I do is I ask the questions. You know, I, I put together a yes, or yes versus no argument at the end of each section. And in this one, I, you know, I asked, was the Las Vegas UFO alien incident a genuine, unexpected, otherworldly event that traumatized the family and captivated the public, or was it something else? So, yes, is what I think. The incident has multiple facets that lend credibility. First, the family in question was evidently distressed, and then we talked about the 911 call. Right? You can't you can't joke around with the 911 uh, system. It's a felony. Secondly, law enforcement was heavily involved that night uh, from the Metro Police. That added a, a very strong layer for me of authenticity. Uh, the body cam footage, despite sections of it being blacked out for privacy laws, uh, it showed all of their reactions. In some cases, their own uh, incredulity uh, juxtaposed with curiosity. Something happened that night, and it was not something that could be readily or easily explained and I, I, I think that we need to pay more attention to that incident. On the other side of the spectrum, uh, a lot of skepticism is arising uh, from various quarters. One, one in particular area is that uh, Jason Steffen, who's a UNLV astrophysicist, he points to what many witnessed in the sky that night as likely being a meteor. And he's probably right about that. And uh, so, and that's fine. But uh to dismiss the idea of an extraterrestrial craft when the ring camera says otherwise is just <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. Those ring cameras, man, they've been great, haven't they, along the way? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. They've shown more things than anybody would ever think. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So given, given the long history of UFO sightings and encounters, we have to take this seriously. Um, and, and again, you know, it's it's funny, but a simple little technology like a ring ca camera can help dispel any notion of it being a hoax. What was that? And I, I challenge people, go to YouTube, look at the ring camera from a nearby home in that neighborhood. It, it literally sounded like, zzz, 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 boom, and then the entire neighborhood lit up. That's not a meteor. Something happened. And you, and you know what, just in general as well, uh, I think that people need to, and, and I think for the most part, our audience does, um, but people got to believe normal everyday people in what they see. Uh, I know people want, well, you know, I want a government official to see it and say it. I want a police officer to say it, you know, see it and say it. I want a military officer to see it and say it. But, you know, because they're all professional observers and they're all, you know, got this 
these credentials going, but so do we normal everyday people. And we are looking up and we are looking out and we see these things and we need to be taken uh, seriously just as much as they do. Especially, especially over the last 20 years, we've seen such a paradigm shift in the world of both paranormal and especially in ufology. For instance, 20 years ago, nothing was being recorded by anyone on a daily basis to the extent that it is today. For instance, everybody has a cell phone. And everybody that has a cell phone today, a smartphone, has what? A high-definition camera that they can record with. They can either snap photos or record videos. And the advent of social media coupled with the technology of the smartphone does what? It gives us a close view of the world that we live in from millions of different perspectives. And we are now seeing so many different things caught on, I want to say caught on film, which shows you how old I am. <laughs> you old man. <laughs> caught, on video, caught on video. Unexplainable things. So, you know, it's, it's funny. A lot of people will, will ask the question, are we seeing light anomalies? Like, are these luminous enigmas, you know, a, a, a femoral plasma or things like that? Or can it be explained by, are we hallucinating, which I call the Joe Rogan effect in the book, right? <laughs> you, you, yeah, I saw I, that. <laughs> everybody in the world is hallucinating due to the effects of mycology, right? It's just, there are natural earth enigmas out there. You know, uh, like, for instance, we just had earthquake in Morocco. And prior to the earthquake, it was recorded, lights, these gigantic flashing earthquake lights is what they call them. We've seen that in Peru. We've seen that in China. Um, one, of the strange, one of the strange things is that um, in, in, in the China event where people, were thought, they, people thought they were seeing UFOs, but in, on, it was a, a, during a warm, clear, cloudless day, the sun dog clouds appeared, which it normally doesn't happen because the sun dog occurs when the sun or the moon shines through a thin, cirrus cloud composed of like hexagonal ice crystals falling with their principal axis vertical. It's just craziness. To, get a, to see a sun dog happen, it has to be a perfect scenario of weather, Right. But it doesn't happen on a clear, cloudless, warm day. What happened on that day later was that a massive earthquake hit. It was potentially what is known as a piezoelectric effect. You know how uh, people, uh, when you go to like some of the uh, the psychic shows and everything, they sell these little uh, pyramids, uh, which they called, um, I forget what they call them. But um, they have the crystals inside of the, uh, inside of the resin because mm -hmm. when you compress a crystal, what it does is, is it releases a piezoelectric effect. You're releasing an electrical charge. Well, imagine the earth, tectonic plates, putting so much pressure on, on underground rock formations that it's creating a light effect through a piezoelectric effect. Interesting conversation with Anthony Sanchez. But I wanted to ask you about David Grush. Right. You, you know we had to go there. You know we had Absolutely. to go there. Yeah, so so David Grush is probably the person that's really shaking up the entire UFO research field, not to mention the government, uh, the government's uh, own look into the UO, UAP and UFO phenomena. So who is he? Okay. So he's a retired Air Force intelligence officer. He's a veteran of both uh, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and the National Reconnaissance Office. And this guy really was in the thick of it. He represented the NRO on the, on the UAP task force from 2019 to 2021. And subsequent, subsequently, he took on the role of co-lead for UAP analysis at the NGA from 2021 to 2022. And he was one of the three witnesses that testified on the July 26th uh, subcommittee hearing. 
<clears throat> excuse me, my voice, sorry about that. <clears throat> but centered around the testimony, what I perceived to be his primary primary concerns were one, the recovery of non-human biological material from alleged UFO crash locations, two, that there's a covert prolonged initiative to decode the technology of extraterrestrial crafts, and three, there are attempts by the government to employ what he calls administrative ter terrorism to muffle those who are trying to reveal the truth. Mm. Uh, speaking of which, if you look at the history of, Dave, of, of Kevin Day, who was part of the uh, 2004 USS, you no, know, well, he was on the USS Princeton, but he was part of that uh, that incident. Uh, I think it was in November 2015. I can't, I can't recall it at the moment. But the point is, with all of this data that's coming out, individuals like Kevin Day, who tried to report what they found, ended up facing a really terrible backlash. And it was unfair, you know, what they had to go through back then. But now, all of a sudden, a lot of the information became declassified. And it's justifying what they were saying years ago. And David Grush prevented, uh, presented a testimony which alluded to events like uh, Magenta, Italy in 1933. He said that years before Roswell, there was a UFO cr crash that was retrieved. And uh, subsequently, the, there was potential for reverse engineering and whatnot. So much information that is coming forth as a result of this testimony. But David Grush really stands out because his concerns are, are something that I really wrote, wrote a lot about in the book. Uh, again, you know, one of the most controversial aspects of ufology is what? It's always been the alleged recovery of non-human biological craft, metamaterials, alien bodies from crash sites. Um, was he able to provide evidence, physical evidence? No, he wasn't. But it, it's not something that we want to discount. Give me one. I apologize. No, you take you take That's a breather. Fine. You 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 check your voice. You get you some water there. I get just as excited talking about this stuff as you do. Uh, Anthony, I go way back, and when we talk and we get together, we get excited, and we just yeah, we sorry. just can't we can't we don't even sleep when we get together. So so no no no. You you ready? Ah. You know, All and I good. Think the it's, it, knows I'm recovering from Guillaume Barre. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. About that, but remember, Connie. The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That's a quote from the late Carl Sagan. So simply because Grush has not provided physical proof, it does not negate the possibility that the U.S. government or any of its partners within the Five Eyes Alliance might possess undisclosed information or materials of non-human origin. And, and, and by the way, what he calls administrative terrorism, I call obstruction and covert reprimand. Uh, obstruction manifested through a, what? A mix of dismissiveness, denials of bureaucratic hindrances, which sub subsequently transitions into punitive action or covert, covert reprimand, where retaliation unfolds against these people discreetly in the shadows, uh, which can, can manifest through either intimidation tactics, job termination, threats, or even the specter of incarceration. This is what people in the military are facing when they come forward with UFO and UAP incidences or evidence. I mean, heck, we had a ton of radar evidence, you know, and not to mention pilots physically encountering the Tic Tac UFO, which is, you know, from the USS Nimitz. This is just this has opened up a can of worms for the government that they have to face because of brave individuals like Ryan Graves, David Fravor, uh, David Grush, and, and Kevin Day. You, you really got to you know, feel bad for Kevin because he was telling the truth and about what he went through, what he experienced, 
Yet he was being dismissed. He fell under the umbrella of that administrative terrorism. But all of a sudden, he's entirely justified, and he deserves an apology from the United States government. I I was going to have Kevin Day on at one point, and something happened. There was some sort of mix-up, and I really would have liked to have had him on. Uh, But he's been on before, obviously. But uh, what? Right, right, absolutely. uh, Somebody we should listen to. So let me let me ask this. This is a kind of it's still on the same subject, but are it, it was always said that we America were the ones that hide it. It's our government that hides it, and the other countries were pretty open about it. Is that still the way it is, or is that even true? Well, let's think about it from this perspective. There is the issue of national security, right? Mm-hmm. We cannot – one of the most straightforward reasons that UFOs in American airspace could be seen as – they could be seen as potential threats. We don't know what they are. We don't know if it's from a foreign, from a foreign uh, adversary or is it from outer space. We don't know. But if the United States has managed to possess – retrieve UFO craft, reverse engineer that technology, you had better believe that the work that goes into that is going to be so heavily compartmentalized that yeah. everybody involved within the project is not going to have any idea what they're working on towards, you know, what, what's the end goal that they're working towards. They're just supposed to be focused on what their piece of the pie is. And ultimately, it could result in what? It can result in technology like what we saw over Beaver, Utah uh, in, I think it was 2016, or the Tic Tac UFO. Could that be reverse engineered technology? Um, That gives us a technological advantage if it's something that we worked on, if the government had retrieved unknown technology, whether or not it's from earthly or non-earthly origin, they might want to study it secretly to gain a technological advantage. So, you know, that's what I think on that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Within the UFO, UAP arena, the ultimate prize would be to have retrieved down alien technology, reverse engineer it, and then use it towards our technical advantage. Uh, So it's something that they would keep under wraps. To answer your question, absolutely. It's something that the government would, would keep under wraps. What do you do? You think the other countries would keep it under wraps, or would they? Well, let's rush. You know, it's purported that there have been down craft in China, in Russia. Let's say, okay, let, let's look at what David Grush said about 1933 in Magenta, Italy. The funny thing about that incident, if it really did happen, and I wrote about this in the book, I did a full analysis on the Magenta, Italy. They call it the fascist files. The funny thing about that incident is what they saw purportedly was a bell-shaped UFO. Now, when you think of a bell-shaped UFO, a lot of people initially might think of the Kecksburg UFO incident. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, they saw uh, an object crash in the woods. Witnesses reported seeing the military retrieve the object. Um, But that also might make you think of the Nazi bell, Die Glocke, which was uh, a purported top-secret Nazi scientific technological advice, a secret weapon, uh, which many people believe was uh, for time travel or was a UFO. But the point is, is that in 1933, if they are correct about what they think they found in Magenta, Italy, this predates Roswell, and it could have been that the Nazis uh, were re- already reverse engineering alien technology, and that's what the Nazi bell was, this mm-hmm. bell-shaped UFO that they saw, and that David Crush, David Grush uh, shared. Uh, in an interview with uh, a French newspaper, Le Parisien, David Grush claimed that the U.S. had possession of a bell-like craft, which Benito Mussolini's government had recovered in northern Italy in 1933. So you see, um, this could be very important. Roberto Pinotti, he's the head 
of the National Ufological Center in Italy. He's the one that purportedly came across these documents, uh, telegrams essentially, talking about a downed craft that uh, was bell-shaped, it was a UFO, and uh, later it was said that the Americans, had, uh, after World War II, had retrieved that. Could that be technology that we're working on, reverse engineering, and again, suppressing for, one, national security purposes, two, a technical, uh, technological advantage? But to answer your question, yes, other countries like Germany, Russia, China, Brazil, uh, Mexico, all these countries have had incidences where there have been UFOs uh, purportedly crashed, retrieved by governments, and essentially we don't know if they're being reverse engineered or sold to the highest bidder, God forbid. But, you know, uh, recently there's been a lot of discussion about the Varginha UFO incident, which involved a series oh. of events in 1996 in Brazil yeah. where they claimed to have seen aliens and mm -hmm. a UFO. So, again, stuff happens all over the world. That was in the 1990s. Um, Amazing story. I love that story. And, and also in, in 1994, not too, not too distant from that, was the aerial school uh, UFO incident, which happened in Zimbabwe with all the kids that saw yeah. a UFO and aliens. This stuff happens all over the world. All the, the time. Is, in the 90s, we had little flip phones that didn't have cameras. Well, today <laughs> in the 2020s, we now have high-powered digital phones or, or, or smartphones with digital cameras that they can essentially shoot movies with. Movies have been shot with iPhones because of the outstanding quality of the high level of pixels and whatnot. So we're going to start seeing things unfold from the general public. And, and by the way, that's why in my book, I literally wrote a section uh, in the book uh, where I talk about a mitigation action that can be taken and intervention, uh, not just for the military and uh, commercial pilots, but also for uh, the general public. You know, I've heard a lot of name dropping going on and a lot of uh, famous incidents going on, and I'm waiting to hear from my boy Lazar. I'm, I'm waiting for you to say something about Lazar on, on any of this. Well, the thing about Bob Lazar is, is that this is a guy who has stuck to his story, has never wavered, and, you know, George Knapp uncovered quite a bit about the Lazar. Well, he uncovered everything about the Lazar story in the beginning uh, yep. uh, going all the way back to John Lear. Um, I, I truly believe that what Lazar is telling us is factual truth. Absolute they did, truth. They, they did wipe out the guy's history as, you know, again, this falls under what David Grush was talking about. Mm -hmm. this, this administrative terrorism. Um, this is what these yep. guys face. You know, this is a very real threat to their careers. Uh, because it poses a risk to, get to, to national security uh, when they and, 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 and it diminishes the technological advantage when they start talking openly about UFOs and reverse engineer technology. Uh, it puts the country at risk, so to speak. But I think that it's very important that now that we've had this congressional hearing with the subcommittee, that we instead of attacking everybody, we start to come together as a community, whether it's the UFO community or the military or the general public, the groups like MUFON, um, and start collaborating. We need transparency, and there has to be open data sharing. Uh, there are so many groups out there. Uh, for instance, you have the, you have, uh, well, there's MUFON, there's a scientific coalition, uh, coalition, for, uh, coalition for UIP studies. Uh, Tom DeLong with the To the Stars, the Academy of, the, of Arts and Sciences. Uh, even Kevin Day started his group, uh, uh, UAP Expedition. There's so many groups out there that have been compiling data on UFOs, UAPs, extraterrestrial incidents, whatnot. It could be, you know, coalesced into one massive repository where we could put together like a natural language programming model like a chat GPT, but to, to focus solely on trying to identify 
and provide answers to the UFO question. And, you know, I even talk about that in my book because being a software engineer and being a database administrator by trade, you know, I often imagine a collaborative, uh, a collaborative platform that coalesces data from the public, the military, the government concerning uh, UIPs and UFOs. And it's something that it's like a dream. But, you know, it's like what Leonard Nimoy said, the miracle is this. The more we share, the more we have. So <laughs> through, through the testimony, I hope that the government sees that there's a benefit to collaborate and to share uh, this data, but not to, put, not to put the country at risk, but to offer an avenue for study, for whether it be academic purposes and, uh, you know, it, I, think, I, think, I just think it's such an important thing. So just just the truth, discussion. you know, yeah. just just right. to know the truth, because that's going to tell us so much about who we are and what we are. And that's my big thing is who are we to each other, to the universe, to others that are out there? Who are we? This will all tell us that kind of thing and more. And, for, and not and just for, that. Mm-hmm. Excuse, excuse I was me. Gonna say, and for UFO researchers, enhanced open reporting mechanisms and platforms. That's what we need. Transparency. Sound, transparency, and not just those in the military and government, but us regular Janes and Joes, because we see them just as much, if not more, um, That that because we're out there looking for it. So I want to, here's something I want to ask you. I'm not even sure how to word it, but I'm sure, I'm sure it goes together in some way. Um, how is all the AI going to be affecting the UFO world? Or is it already? I mean, tell what am I asking? I don't even know. I'll tell you. There's two sides to the story with regards to artificial intelligence, right? One, like in the book, I talk about this, uh, this collaborative effort. We can imagine the profound, the profound value of treating collective information from groups like MUFON, the government and military sources, and people like us, regular people, as training data for an NLP model like ChatGPT that can offer instant access to an interlinked data set comprised of millions of entries triggering billions of data points into neural action, essentially creating a sentient repository that we can use for UFO research. But here's the other side of the tale when it comes to artificial intelligence. And you're probably hearing a lot of people talk about it. <clears throat> you remember in the 1980s, the Terminator movie in Skynet. Remember that? Yes. It scared the, it scared the heck out of everybody. <laughs> well, it did. imagine this. We are now creating... What many people in the UFO community and research field believe, and, and really everybody, everybody believes that with the advent of, of AI, such as ChatGPT, we're creating sentient entities that are what? <laughs> they're not human, so technically they're alien. We're creating an alien sentience from artificial intelligence. And that's a very scary prospect. And that's but and but that's one of the things along the way that um, we've all talked about um, on radio or not, where movies have played a part in preparing us for the future of what is going to come down, what is going to happen. And these movies were going to prepare us by, you know, like Men in Black. Close right. encounters. We can go on and on to prepare yeah. us because, and and we've all seen these things. I I read this before in some paperwork that was put into my apartment at one point and then taken away at one point. Really weird, odd, crazy stuff. But talking right. about movies because hey, it hits the mass public and hits and the most amount Hollywood, of people, obviously. Right, and Hollywood can serve as a mechanism for conditioning. Get conditioning. So that we're ready for such an event. But here's yeah. where I was headed earlier. 
<clears throat> we have Elon Musk Starlink, right? The network? Yes. Up in, the, in the lower Earth uh, atmosphere. Oh, excuse me, lower Earth orbit, excuse me. Starlink, we have all of these military drones that operate on artificial intelligence. And we have ground-based artificial intelligence systems that are gaining sentience. This is a combination of three things that can go rogue if it, go, if it goes unchecked. If there are no checks and balances in place for the artificial intelligence that is emerging, something strange could happen. Imagine drones being controlled by a ground-based uh, artificial intelligence sentience that is sending signals up to Starlink that is in turn sending wireless signals to the drones to wreak havoc on the planet. That can be like That's the beginning of a nightmare scenario such as Skynet. So is it possible? Sure. Is it probably going to happen? Probably not. So, but, it, you know, this, these are the types of things we need to think about because we're in the, we're in the baby phase of AI. It's just now emerging into the public and we got to be careful. Okay, so I I got another question for you. Take a little guzzle of some water cuz I'm going to I'm going to try to being a female here, I'm going to figure out the question as I'm thinking. That's what we do. You know, we're good that way. We hold your attention that way too. So because, you know, we're we're living in the moment. All right. So you have interviewed tons of people. You've experienced things, boots on the ground. Um, conversation after conversation with people, just uh, thought after thought, pondering yourself. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what what do you, 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 Anthony, what do you think is actually going on? And what do you think it's all about? I, I do believe that to some extent we are going through a conditioning phase, uh, whether, whether, I mean, who it is exactly, I don't know, but is it the government and is it a combination of media outlets such as Hollywood, mainstream news organizations? We are definitely being conditioned, conditioned for something. And it kind of makes sense that now for the first time in 50 years, the government is paying attention People like uh, Fravor, Graves, and Grush, and Kevin Day, their information is finally being paid attention to, it's being taken seriously, and we have so much evidence now, radar evidence, that proves UFOs exist. It cannot be denied. UFOs do exist. Now, do aliens exist? Um, if my yes. late friend... Uh, <laughs> And, and, and fellow UFO researcher Ed Grimsley was still alive. He's a Coast to Coast alumni, by the way. If he were still yes. with us today, he would say, yes, definitely, there are aliens. And yes. I am one who would likely concur with that sentiment. Yeah. I do believe that there are aliens among us. I do believe that UFOs are a very real phenomena. And I think that we need to pay attention to the conditioning process, which is Hollywood, the media, Mm -hmm. and information that is being disseminated to the public. Mm -hmm. Yep, really, really notice those films along the way that are just in our heads forever. So, okay, so I asked you that. Now, I'm going to go a little deeper with it because <laughs> you have concurred. Yep, you believe aliens are among us. What do you think it's that they're here for what do you think it's all about who are we to them mm -hmm. you know so I remember, <laughs> in two, I remember in 2011 i was in taos new mexico uh at janet sailor's uh aspe symposium that is the uh, alliance studying paranormal events or experiences excuse me and i met up with travis walton there and i had a conversation with them and it was very interesting that Travis 
being, having been abducted by aliens right there in Snowflake, Arizona, a place I've been to, by the way. Um, that's just a skip, jump, and a hop away from Dulce, New Mexico, where purportedly there are great aliens working alongside facets of the military-industrial complex and the government, the U.S. government or the military. So I think, I think that if you look at the, the, the story that was told to me about Dulcie from this Colonel X, these aliens have been a part of human history going back thousands of years, thousands of years back to the cradle of civilization between the Euphrates and the Tigris River. It all relates back to the Anunnaki and the Ajiji. Everything is inter, everything is interconnected. There's this co-mingling of religions and myths and lore that goes back thousands and thousands of years. So it is potential. It is very potential that there is an alien presence here that's been here for a long time, and that we're also being visited by new extraterrestrial entities. I don't have the answers, but I am seeking them. I'm mm-hmm. trying to delve into the unknown. I, I have theories. Yes. And, uh, one, of, one of my theories is that this planet has been inhabited by aliens for hundreds of thousands of years. And it has a lot to do with the emergence of humanity's uh, exponential leap in technology. I mean, literally, Connie. 100 years ago, where were we as as a, as a global society, humanity? Where were we just 100 years ago? We I think we had horses and carriages, horses, right? Buggies. Yeah, the buggies, and there was no technology. Yet, yep. if you look at the entire timeline of humanity or the timeline of the Earth, which is 4 billion years old, and if you look at the timeline of humanity— and if we go back to the mitochondrial Eve theory, which says we just came out of Africa 250 to 300,000 years ago upright, and we began to spread across the planet, and it was the emergence of, of us as a species, right? You know, where we're intelligent and we're talking, and we're finally able to do stuff. This past 100 years is but a micro millisecond, a blip in that timeline. Mm-hmm. Yes, we've gone from horse buggies and no technology, you know, and you, you, you cannot count the Industrial Revolution as part of that leap to where we are now with integrated circuits, artificial intelligence, fiber optic technology, the ability to travel in space. It's just insane how quickly humanity has jumped from 100 years ago through to today. I mean, this is why I'm trying to scrutinize all of this UFO, UAP information in the book. I'm trying to, I'm even looking into the interstellar object Oumuamua, which Avi Loeb, a Harvard professor, says was an alien craft, potentially. And he just found these spherules in the ocean, which kind of proves some of his theories. Um, we really need to look into the tic tac toe UFO enigma. We've got to go back to Roswell. Was this Magenta Italy in 1933 event a real occurrence? All of it needs to be studied because everything probably will be connected back to the fact that there has always been an alien presence here on Earth. Maybe it's already been studied. Mm-hmm. That's why it's oh, kept quiet. Why do, why do you think it's such a secret, though? Why do you think they have to just shh, don't say anything? It goes back to technological advantage and national security. We are in a competition with countries across the globe, uh, both friendly countries and non-friendly countries. It is a healthy, robust competition of who can have the best technology, who can develop their society quicker than the others. And all of it has to do with you know, technology. Technology is the basis for everything now. We live in a modern technological society. But and why can't we think a little higher and a little bigger and say, you know what? If we all come together on this, we talk about what we know, mm-hmm. we we become transparent to all, everyone about what's 
what we know and what is happening. And then we all become one as humans and earthlings, and we're prepared for what we may need to be prepared for, whether it's friendship or not, with what's outside of here, or at well, least what's here and, and non-human. Well, there are many factors. Uh, I, I like to think about the I like to think about of what I call the Star Trek Utopia, where the entire planet has done away with monetary systems. And we work for the benefit of humanity. Everybody can do what they want to do so long as it helps the others. And then we, uh, we eventually evolve into this highly technological, highly moral society that's traveling the stars and whatnot, right? But how can we get to that point when we live in a very divided world? I mean, we're, there's a lot of tribalism going on. In the United States, we have the left versus the right. And you have these nationalist movements emerging all across the globe, pitting people against each other. Until we can learn to establish some type of a quorum amongst one another peacefully, we're not going to make that technological and moral leap towards a Star Trek type of, of utopia. Now, see, I think we'll take that leap immediately as soon as transparency is given because it, it'll be a must. And if they give it that quickly, it'll probably be because they've been forced to do it. But I think it's also the aliens that keep it quiet. Well, here's another thing, too. Remember, Ronald Reagan said if we were faced with an alien threat, mm -hmm. the entire planet would have to come together. Yes. So Agreed. So, right. So that puts us in a position where, you know, do we have to face some sort of evil existential alien threat in order for us to put all our differences aside and finally come together. I hope that that's not the case. I would like to see it just happen organically through our humanity that we realize, hey, going to war with one another and all this other stuff, it's not good for us. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, that's a whole other discussion. But uh, Yeah, and, and I agree with you. I wish it would happen organically like that but uh, but the way they're taking it it looks like no they're going to wait till the last second but then again could be all up to the aliens hey there scott you're on the air welcome what you talking about willis what you talking uh, about willis <laughs> a different strokes flashback to tv show <laughs> anyway, you're right i'm i'm going to take us a complete 180 and you know a lot of people have ailments that the average person cannot comprehend and so just being blessed in the days that we have and enjoy each and every day. Um, my question is to Anthony, and, you know, I lost a friend to ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and he left behind a wife and three young kids, three young boys. And during my buddy's struggle and fight, I wanted to ask him questions of his emotions on the situation that he was, you know, the fight that he was struggling with. And if it's not to, you know, if it's not, if it's inappropriate, I was just wondering, Anthony, what was it like to be paralyzed? And what a blessing it is that you're on demand. And I was just, I'm just curious about that struggle, if you don't mind was, sort of. Right, absolutely. So, so again, in 2019, August, I was hit with Guillain-Barre syndrome, and then I uh, spent uh, three months in the ICU, three long months. And then another three months in a recovery center there at the hospital. And I lost the ability to not only move, but to speak. I couldn't speak for two years. And I couldn't move for two years. Um, you can imagine the first six months at the hospital, all I could do was stare up at the ceiling tiles. And I truly believe that that experience had an effect on me, uh, it literally altered my brain. For instance, I think that my cognitive abilities suffered because internally, while I was trying to articulate things to people, it just was impossible. Nothing was coming out of me. I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. I couldn't write. I couldn't speak. And then two years later, when I finally regained speech, and the ability to move again, because Guillain-Barre syndrome is not permanent, thank God. I think that, you know, I had like this burst of energy that had been 
suppressed by the Guillain Barre. And I do notice that parts of me um, are having difficulties, especially with my speech, trying to articulate. But there was this extent of nerve damage. But, uh, you know, Connie was mentioning earlier how I had experienced a near-death experience three times. Three times I crossed over to the other side. And thank God for the people at the hospital. They were brilliant. They were angels, and they brought me back. And I have to tell you, for me personally, this is not the final plane of existence. There's something else happening. And uh, does it all connect with uh, what we're talking about tonight, UFOs, aliens, uh, delving into religious aspects, spiritualism, going back thousands and thousands of years? I think to some extent that it does. Um when my book, The Crossing, comes out later this year, I'm really going to delve into that. But I have to tell you, it was difficult. Being paralyzed changes you. And uh, for two years, two years, that's a long time. That is a long time. All I wanted to do was fight to come back because I'm a father and a young daughter and two young boys. Well, young men now. But uh, every ounce of me fought every second of every day to get back so that I could be here with you guys. You know, I want to be back in the world of the living. And uh, I, I offer my condolences to everyone who has lost anybody from ALS, MS, uh, Guillain-Barre. Because by the way, the type of Guillain-Barre syndrome that I had, it has a 98% mortality rate. I'm very lucky to be alive. I cannot imagine you not talking for any length of time. So I know that was tough for you because you're a communicator. And right. I'm, yeah, you know, I mean, it's just, that's just, I remember when you were coming out of it. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of tears, a lot of tears because it really takes an emotional toll on you, both physically and mentally, and not being able to communicate. Uh, and then when you can finally communicate, being in, uh, incapable of articulating is very tough. Yeah, you so had to learn I, to talk again. I, I had to learn how to talk again. Mm-hmm. And my mind for two years, not being able to process speech, was affected by that. And my ability to talk again, it literally, I was starting all over again. But thank God, you know, I did years of of writing for my books, so I was able to delve back into reading what I had written, and it helped me recover so many areas of my brain. Out of Canada. Hey there, Don. Welcome. You're on Coast to Coast AM. Hi, Connie. Hi, Anthony. Um, I think, well, we were talking about aliens earlier, and um, I'm beginning to realize that we're just somebody's uh, sheep. Um, They... It, they use us as a food source energetically and physically. If you look at the amount of people that go uh, missing every year, the secondary part of it is I'm beginning to realize that um, the whole purpose of, of of like trying to get out of out of the, the the maze or the the role or whatever they want to call it or the role of karma or the wheel of karma or John Lennon did a song about it and all the rest of it is to that we're just that's part of the it's part of the trap but the reason we keep coming back is we try to figure it out and we try to to get the people that we care about out as well and bring them to the realization that uh that we're we're caught in this little wheel and we got to return back to higher source um you had a show on the other day somebody was talking about hugh we also have the, the jonathan Jonathan, I'm trying to remember his last name, Goldberg, I think it is. He talked about humming, but there's hewing. But all those things will connect you with source energy and, and enlighten you to to have a higher state of awareness, higher state of consciousness to get out of here. I don't know. I, I didn't make the mouse trap. I just trying to figure out how to get out of it. But anyway, there's <laughs> there's kind of my question. I think yeah, is this <clears throat> so. But those multiple multiple levels of uh, alien beings are some of them trying to help us evolve to a higher level of consciousness, 
And then there's other ones that just want to keep us here. And uh, like I said, energetically and uh, physically as a food source. Right. I remember years ago I had a discussion with Jay Widener, prolific author and filmmaker, and we were discussing the Archons. I don't know if you ever heard of the Archons, but they discovered these books in Egypt, uh, I believe it was in the 1930s, these two brothers, they, what we now know as the Nag Hammadi Codices. And in the Nag Hammadi Codices, we learned about the Gnostics. Uh, well, we learned a lot more about the Gnostics and their take on religion and how they believe there were these entities called the Archons that fed on our souls and our emotions. And they were the ones that were to eat us as well? Well, no, not physically eat us, but uh, feed off of us, off, off of our soul, off of our motive, our emotional mm. health. Yeah. Mm. The more angry we get, the, the better for them. Sorry, guys. You know, vocal break. Yeah, I, I think there's, um, I think there's nice ones. I think there's kind ones. I think there's ones that you know. I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I think there's good, bad, and then there's some that it's just indifferent. They don't even care. Yeah, and, they. And then again, that's a tie-in back in. That ties back into this religious aspect. Yeah. Where there's a connection between alien entities emanating from mythical or religious lore from multiple cultures across the globe. And uh, the Archons being just one of many that we know of. So that's interesting. Wild card line number two, let's talk to Jerry out of Iowa. Hey there, Jerry, you're on the air. Um, hi, hi, Connie and Anthony. Um I, for one, would love to have a drink with Connie after dark while listening to excellent bumper music. Uh, <laughs> I had to get that in. Um, so, Anthony, uh, I really uh, respect your experience for two years when you, you couldn't, you could only speak with your spirit. And so I have a, it's kind of a weird question, and I don't know if I should ask it, but it did occur to me. So, uh, it's I'm, I'm thinking that um, you're talking about uh, chat GPT and AI earlier, and I'm more, I'm just thinking like, if, could there be a universal uh, chat, like super AI chat GPT that God or aliens or Jesus or the Holy Spirit has that whenever it, humans encounter the great beyond, that it's it's like you just talk and it just is sort of a standard protocol like whenever we talk to the universe or god or jesus that it was it just it's like a super intelligent response mechanism i know that's kind of nebulous but since you spent two years not communicating i'm guessing you had some kind of a interface with the great beyond uh, so I, I hope you can work for that question i know it's really weird but so thank you very much you know i gotta tell you during that time period i was traveling i was mm. traveling to another place and you know i write about that in the in the crossing again that book was my therapy writing all of that experience down was a form of therapy for me but this existence, this plane of existence that we are on, is just one of many. People often talk about these interdimensional beings, you know, because there's multidimensional uh, possibilities. I truly believe that all of us are comprised uh, of, of the same stuff down at the atomic level. And because of that, when we no longer exist on this plane, it doesn't mean that the energy, all, you know, the energy stored within the atoms that make us dissipates into nothingness. I think it carries over into another plane of existence. Our consciousness may continue to persist if it were to be integrated into some sort of, like the gentleman was saying, some sort of sentience created by some otherworldly technology that is uh, akin 
you know, that is uh, uh, similar to the artificial intelligence that we're now seeing emerge. Who's to say that that's not one of many possibilities? It's hard to put into words, isn't it, when you've experienced right. the other side? Exactly. It's and when you, hard to describe. Yeah. And when you have that knowing that, you know, you're just, you're, you, you go on. It's just hard. When, I, when, I, when that happened to me, um, I kept visiting a place that was told to me was called the Vortex, which was you travel through this Vortex, you end up in this other reality, and there are people there. And there's a whole world of activity that's going on. And uh, it's just something that just, I had to write it down, Connie. I had to write down that experience because I was coming and I was going in and out of this existence during that time period. The six months that I was at the hospital, uh, and three times that I nearly died. So you're conscious this whole time. You're not in a coma or anything. No, I'm wide awake. I can see the only thing that worked were my eyes. Well, you were you were an abductee. <laughs> I was I was able to blink. Uh, thank God for that. Uh, but you know, I literally looked like a zombie. I could not close my mouth. Mm. I, I, everything about me was gone. I was completely and utterly paralyzed, except for the fact that I could blink my eyes. And you know what I'm saying, right? That's that's uh, uh, abductees that can't right, move, right. but can move my eyes. It's a form of paralysis, exactly. Yeah. Did you – now, I know um, – just a real quick question here before we go into the break. Um, did you ever want to stay when you saw the light? It's not when I saw a light. It's when I saw people. I honestly feel that at one point, I met someone on the other side and formed a relationship. And it was hard to come back to this reality when I had formed something in that reality. Something that was, uh, yeah, yeah. So you did experience the no time as well as the love. Very much so. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what, Connie, I'm going to send you a copy of the book. The crossing before anybody else, so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, yeah, I know because it's like, man, you're being so vague. I'm trying to get it out of you, but I know yeah. it's in the book. <laughs> there's another world. There's another world, and you you travel through the vortex, and uh, some of us who travel are able to do things on the other side, and it's a very interesting existence. Yeah. Now, when you went three different times, did you see three different things? Get this, I was able to go more than three times. Um, I think the, the, the three times that I nearly died, that I, I may have died, uh, are what gave me that ability to traverse back and forth between our existence and that existence. Here, here's a, here's a um, uh, perk of being a Blue Rocker, my show, Blue Rock Talk, which you've been on a long, long time ago. Got to get you back on, by the way. Yes. yes. And. And we got, you know, I think it'd be fun to show the documentary that, you know, you shot for for us. Absolutely. I think that'd be fun. So, okay, our Blue Rocker member, uh, Michael from New Bloomington, Ohio. He says, Connie, could you ask Anthony if he remembers the, I think it's, uh, it's C-O-Y-N-E. So I think it's COIN, Uf, the COIN UFO incident. It happened over Charles Mill Lake. That's near Mansfield, Ohio. This was back in 73. This year would be the 50th anniversary of the event. It was near a collision of an Army Reserve helicopter and UFO. And he wondered, too, has the case's original official conclusion remained the same or has it changed? Do you know anything about that? Right. That's called the COIN UFO helicopter event. When, like you said, in 1973, there was four Army National Guard members, including the pilot, Lawrence Coyne, a C-O-Y-N-E, but it's pronounced Coyne, okay. that claimed to encounter the UFO while they were on a flight near Mansfield. Now, here's the thing. They reported that the object hovering above their aircraft, the helicopter, was maneuvering in a way that defied conventional aviation capabilities. Not only that. 
It seemingly defied the laws of physics, similar to what? The Tic Tac UFO. I'm not saying mm. it was a Tic Tac UFO, but it's amazing that UFOs that are reported by pilots, the commercial pilots, military pilots, often report that the craft are defying the laws of physics. They're maneuvering in ways that are seemingly impossible. Yeah, that's. I was only three years old when that happened, but yeah, that's a well-known case. So are the Tic Tac shape the same as people when they say the cigar shape? Well, if, if we take a look at the Tic Tac UFO for what it is, uh, it is uh, a 40-foot-long a object, stark white, eerily reminiscent of a Tic Tac candy. So there's no wings, no discernible means of propulsion. I guess you could say it's like a cigar, but not really, because <laughs> they, they describe it as a Tic Tac, not a cigar. This is true. But, you know. Some of the cigars I see people smoking now, and maybe they're not cigars. Uh, who knows? Let's go. Let's go to wild card line number one and talk to Joe from Monterey. Hey there, Joe. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Thank you, Connie, for taking my call. Yes. And thank you, Anthony, for staying in the physical world. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> which sometimes is not that uh, difficult, but you have to reincarnate, and that's a Vicious cycle. Now, you, would t- you mentioned the archons, which is uh, a favorite uh, topic of mine. I never get a chance to talk about it. But there's something above the archons called the demiurge. And the demiurge, this is becoming more and more po- uh, uh, popular knowledge now because there are people that are running into it and they're talking about it and people are finding out. Uh, this is known as the lesser god. The God of good and evil. Uh, this is the um, this controls from I believe from the top of the astral down to the physical. So we're under its dome, if you will. This is one of the reasons why we can't find the truth unless we discover it ourselves, and then people don't want to believe us. There's a mind control here. And you know, one of the interesting things, too, about the Demiurge is a lot of people believe that lesser God is actually, and I don't want to be controversial, but it's the God of the Abrahamic religion. And so in the Archonic, in the Archonic, in the Archontics uh, view in, from Gnosticism, they see that as an evil entity, yet that evil entity supposedly is the god you know, of the abrahamic religion so i don't know it's, it's very controversial but the uh archons in gnosticism and religions uh, today uh there's a there's a lot of uh, interconnectivity uh from a lot of the uh the books that, are, that were found in the nag Hammadi codices the stories in the nag Hammadi codices there's remember gnosticism was kind of like lost to history there are no Gnostics today that can be traced back to that original group. So a lot of it was lost. Thank God they found the Nag Hammadi Codices, but it was, I think it was in 1936. So those stories do persist. I, I have a copy of the Nag Hammadi Codices in my room. So, yeah, you know, we, can, we, we have that ability to read into that. But it's very interesting that uh, one of the theories put out there is that the Demiurge is, in fact, the God of the Abrahamic religions. So, and, and that the Abrahamic religion, uh, again, I don't want to get into controversial aspects. But, Why not? Uh, That's what we do. <laughs> right, Just okay, saying. So, so there are people out there that posit the idea that the Abrahamic religions, all three of them, have been worshiping the wrong God, an evil entity. See, uh, it's very controversial. I don't want to go there. I'm not the one saying that. It's just what has been said. Did did you leave, Joe, or did you have more? Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Um, Anthony, uh, I know how controversial, how controversial it is, uh, but if people understand what they're reading, um, this is the uh, what some of us know, and I've, I've known this for, oh, gee, 39 years. Um, 
know this thing, this God, as the two-faced God, the God of good and evil. And it is the God of all religions. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have good people. This is the most important thing. In fact, some of the, the writings have been inspired, and this is from our higher self. This is from other help that we may get. And this mm-hmm. is where you come in and talk about the movies giving us information. Yes, absolutely. For a long right. time, for over 50 years, I've met people that we get information from unlikely sources. These movies are written if they're inspired, and usually sci-fi, because you can get away with a lot of things on sci-fi, and mm-hmm. Roddenberry knew about that. And you look at some of his shows, and says, whoa, gee, you know, he might have been right on. But there are other movies, and I know you know a lot of them, that they are written on multi-levels, because when we're inspired, and we mm-hmm. channel our higher self, we bring in knowledge from other dimensions, And this is the most important thing about channeling for yourself and writing or painting and being creative. Now, the Demiurge, it it, it feeds on us, on our energy, and it's called louche. It is uh, an energy that has been tainted by negative emotions. It is our energy that flows to us, but if we're angry, and you mentioned it, by the way, angry or you you taint it, it draws upon that. That's why in the religion, God demands that you love it, but your love is tainted because it's 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 not unconditional love, and it's in all the scriptures and everything. Now, when we go into an altered state, we may contact with our higher self, and we are more closer to the truth. But when you're in fear, and you pray to God out of fear, that energy is sucked up, and many people get drained. It's like a parasite. The uh, archons are actually ver- parasites, and they were created by the, by the, demi- uh, the demiurge right. as its henchmen. So archons in Gnosticism, you know, they're seen as these, uh, well, the Gnostics believe them to be celestial beings responsible for creating and maintaining the physical universe. Yet, they're often depicted as evil, malevolent beings, deceitful beings that try to keep humanity trapped in the physical world. Uh, The Bible even mentions uh, uh, archons uh, in the system of the Gnostics mentioned by Epiphanius, we find seven archons that are mentioned indirectly in the Bible. So there are definitely connections between what the Gnosticism movement was putting out uh, alongside the other, well, this predated, I believe, uh, uh, Islam. But I know that the early the early uh, Jewish religion and then uh, ultimately uh, Christianity uh, had uh, interconnected uh, writings that, that uh, dealt with Gnosticism, with, with the archons from Gnosticism. Good stuff. Thanks, Joe, for calling in and uh, getting into that conversation. First-time caller, let's talk to Philip out of Texas. Philip, you're on the air. Hey, Tony. You guys got some champagne? We need to pop it. I'm so excited to come on the air. <laughs> pop it. <laughs> that guy Joe was talking... So, so informed and so long. I thought I thought there was another person. You had another guest on the program. I thought, oh wait, am I calling you at the wrong time? <laughs> he knows his stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's going to jump back a little bit. But both uh, you and, and your guest were talking earlier about. Um, he was at a place and he was saying that he felt really bad. He said his head was burned and he, you know some people had headaches and things of that nature. Well, what was that site again that you know, you were visiting? Because I was just going to suggest. EMS and EMPs. If it's something where someone wanted y'all to be away from there, somebody mm. could do a nasty, nasty trick to, you know, that's what it's used in the military, too, is, as weapons, and it's all basically how, how you turn up the channel or the, the frequency. Connie, you, well, what Connie was mentioning that she was in Dulce, that uh, they had a, they felt like there was a physical presence, uh, something trying to cause physical harm to them. But, I mean, Connie, it kind of almost sounded like you were talking about 
uh, direct, you know, directed energy weapons. I mean, it was kind of, I mean, I'm just putting that out there. Oh, oh, well, in remote viewing, if somebody, uh, to me, hybrids and people that, well, you know, that they have a little bit more in them than others, uh, they can view your head and, you know, view what's going on inside your mind, just like alien. To me, it's hybrid. You're half alien, half human. You know, look like a human. You got the alien uh, abilities and you can view. Uh, We have a lot of remote viewers uh, that are very, 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 very good that, Again, I think all, I, I'm into the hybridization project. I'm into uh, Bud Hopkins, right, and D- David Jacobs. So, so I think a lot of that's happening. But you can feel it. Some people can feel it. I'm one that can, but but not everybody does. But you can feel it, and there's a personality to it. And it and that one, that one hurt. Wow, wow, it's interesting. Um, yeah. It, oh, did did we lose Philip? I was gonna. I was gonna. No, I'm still are, here. Are you driving in a – what are you driving in? Um, well, I'm, I have to be out to look at the nighttime sky. It's beautiful, oh. Texas. No, I'm just – what kind of – I stopped. I, I have stopped, but it's – But are are you in a big truck? No, 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 just a personal oh. vehicle. Oh, personal okay. Vehicle. I was going to I was gonna ask for a big big horn sound, but I guess you could give me a little beep. <laughs> I'm a, little, a Mustang convertible. It's, oh. It's so, I was gonna, so he, when he was talking about his – his headache, and he got back to his hotel room. He said his head was burning. Was that along the same things there too? Then, that as you were talking about about viewing, I don't, I don't know. The, our guide, uh, he was uh, from Dulce. He was part of the Hickory Apache. He told us not to touch anything up there, and we just stupidly touched everything. And I got very sick. <laughs> I, I suffered a form of paralysis. I was. Uh, oh. Quite literally dealing with a lot of pain. I'm going to ask anybody that attended that uh, conference that we ended up going to right after that event. Something happened. It was just an odd time in my life. Yeah, I'm glad. He, listen to the guy. I'm glad he brought that up. I'd like to talk to you more about that while I have you here. Because, okay, so you're at the top of the mesa, and this is, and you see airplane parts. These are, they were massive shipping containers for jet engines just sitting up there. Oh. Cool. Yeah. I remember like, you talking about that. Right. They're just sitting up there. And I got a picture of uh, Rick Prescott. You got a picture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have, we have, we, I've got pictures of this. They're circulated. They're all online. And, uh, you know, the, our, our guy, by the way, who was a former police officer there, uh, Vickery Apache, told us. You know, but we finally, when we came across those things and we started messing with them, he said, I don't want to be in your video. I don't want you guys taking pictures of me or my dog or my truck. And we need to get the heck out of here. So it was kind of a surreal event to find military equipment up at the top of the Mesa. Well, the, now, the thing, there's no military presence there. Not since the time of the U.S. Calvary. Hmm. <clears> hmm. <throat> Now, we, the different times that I went, I think one time we stayed at that little hotel there, right? There's that one hotel. Yeah, there's the casino and the hotel there. The Wild yeah, that, yeah, oh, that's it. And, but each time we just kind of went in, drove wherever we wanted to drive. Uh, but, but it, I, I remember going to the casino. Yeah, well, and some people, yeah, and some people were coming out and I would just ask them. You know, hey, what do you know about what's going on around here? And and I got many different stories. Uh, this was when, in my UFO days and alien days, and they were talking Bigfoot at that point. I, I wasn't there yet. I, I'm there now. But yep. they were also talking about how you could look out your window and you could just see the other side of the street moving to the left or moving to the right or trees just moving past you, things like that happening. Just crazy stuff. And so they, kind of, they said it as if it was normal. Yeah, well, here's something else that's kind of strange about Dulcie. I met with multiple families there uh, who reported hearing traffic beneath their homes. Yes. Like yeah. traffic, cars, the, vehicles of some sort beneath yeah. their homes. Yeah. That's Did strange. you hear about the talking wells? But let me say yeah. what I'm going to say, and then okay. I'm going to go on. Um, okay. <laughs> Just like Joe 
I just don't believe in reincarnation, but I do do believe in demonic attack. And just like I tell everybody, I'm the God, guns, and gold man, the Bible, bullets, and beans man, telling everybody to get ready. Uh, Connie, for the last two or three weeks, because I told George, I just felt real bad. And if you read Paul in the Bible, he had this thorn in his side. So it could have been the side of his head where Satan was trying to get a hold of him. And you can see where a lot of people are committing suicide. I call them the satanic suicides and demonic depression or devil's depression because you have two gods. That's the God of this world, which is the devil, and then the God of all the worlds, which is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and the Son, of course, is Jesus Christ. But I believe this uh, our AI, I think it's instead of artificial intelligence, it's antichrist intelligence. And just like your uh, previous guest, Anthony Sanchez, this is a non-human thing that's coming out and everything. It can be used for good. I look at Elon Musk. He said he's going to start putting chips in everybody, and he can make the blind see and the lame walk. I think that's the mark of the beast coming. As long as it's voluntary, if people want to take it, that's fine. But once they start forcing people to take things, then that's where we're going to have a problem. And if you look, Biden has this thing called the digital dollar that he wants to put out. And uh, people just need to be aware of it. We've gone cashless here at the Coliseum and stuff in Alexandria, Louisiana. So I don't know how many other places have gone cashless. But we need to be aware. Just read the Bible. Read Revelation, Daniel, Luke 21. And Matthew 24. And I think the aliens are really the fallen angels, but they could be God's angels too. So those are the only two aspects. But Connie, thank you for giving me the time. Oh, let me tell you one more thing before I get off the air. If you go to YouTube, look up Cornelius Lawson White. I'm at a city council meeting August the 8th. I'm speaking, but you'll hear a demon or something growling in the background. So go to Cornelius Lawson White, YouTube, August the 8th, Alexandria City Council meeting. Hear the demon, Connie. Well, wait a minute. I got to ask I got to ask you something. You're an eater. You like to eat. You like good Cajun food. You like southern food. You like you got it going on. Was it your stomach? <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no. It wasn't no grumbling, okay. no stomach. All right. You can hear it. it's an audible growl and stuff and it, it's unbelievable so you listen to it and you tell me because okay. i'll be i'll be honest with you, i've been under demonic depression just like uh joe from monterey because he he said it on the air a couple of weeks ago so it's well, real thanks, thanks for calling in i'm gonna make sure i'm gonna listen to that growl make sure it's not your stomach okay all right thanks cornelius thanks for calling in Let's go wild card line number two, continue with open lines. Talk to Ed out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Hello there, Ed. You are on Coast to Coast AM. Hey, honey. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the call. I I was wanting to ask him a couple of questions. One thing, I too have thought about going back 150 years. We we were horse and buggy. We had nothing. Yeah, Uh, I know. People tried to come along like Marconi. He had to leave Italy. They were wanting to put him in an insane asylum at 19 or 20. The genius was going to invent the uh, wireless, and he had to go to England to do it. Uh, uh, Madame Curie discovered radium, and if we went back in time and tried to warn her and say, take that rock out of your pocket, it's going to kill you. There's invisible stuff going into your body. They'd put you in an insane asylum. I mean, look how fast we have had to accumulate knowledge. It's unbelievable, like he says. It's got to be some sort of alien connection, you would think, to come up with all of these incredible changes in such a eye blink of time historically. The thing I wanted to ask him was about uh, uh, Sitchkin, his book, uh, uh, The Twelfth Planet. Uh, He was wanting to know what's going on. I think it pretty much starts with that. I'm sure you're familiar with the book. Um, No, I'm not. Jeremiah Sitchkin, The Twelfth Planet. You need to get that book. 
<laughs> well, write it. Let's see. Let me write it down. Just kidding. You can just Google you know, it. You, you, you should. The 12th planet, Jeremiah Sitchkin. Let me tell you, my uncle was head of foreign eastern language at harvard he graduated number one in his class at an ivy league school he spent many years nice. in china and got some key people out when world war ii started from korea and all he's in wikipedia and there's a billion and a half people over there in asia and they find mongolian tablets uh i mean he's passed away now but i mean when they when he was active they would find three thousand year old mongolian tablets and they couldn't even read them. They they were Asian, and and they dust them, bring them to my uncle. He'd dust them off and translate them. Now this gave me great respect for people that translate things, which is what Jeremiah Sitchkin did. He was a language expert. At eleven years old, he started arguing with his Jewish scholar. At eleven, he was so confident. He he was telling him, "You're you're not understanding the Jewish language historically properly," and so. <clears throat> What I like, Connie, is these people are not emotional. They are just reading what they see down on the rocks or however, and, and if, if it's in something permanent like a rock, it's pretty important. And so uh, he he uh, just read what it was. That, that, that it's a planet that comes around here about every 3,000 years around our solar system, and they're two planet brothers, X. and they were battling for control. They live many, many more years than we do. And they came down here, and they made a lot of us into sort of slaves to dig gold in Africa for them. They don't use gold as money. They do something with the gold and change it to a white powder where it's uh, very valuable as a resource. But they are always battling for control. And uh, supposedly now they're coming back, and they're on the verge of being back here. And uh, But you need to read the book because— Are you talking uh, Planet X? Not... Are you talking about Planet X? No, I'm, I'm not. I'm talking really? about his, the planet he talks about that comes around every 3,000 years. And and basically, uh, the other one, what's going on is you, you've seen the Georgia Guidestones. You, you see those, right? You saw mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, see, they want like 500 million people on the earth at one time. See, one of the brothers thinks we're, that we're ruining the earth, and, and they're trying to depopulate the heck out of us, is the theory. And the other one... Uh, wants to let us be and kind of let the earth be a museum and, and let us uh, make our own way. So, uh, and I, I won't say any more than that, but there's a whole lot more going on with that behind the scenes and all. And, and one thing that bothers me a little bit is if the government's starting to want to bring out the alien connections and saucers and things, you got to worry why are they doing it. Are they trying to uh, scare us into thinking... Uh, as a way to control us, that that, uh, that we could be invaded and in, in trying to, you know, uh, to me, there's they're up to no good. <laughs> well, Ed, I appreciate the phone call, and uh, I I also agree with that. And I wonder, I wonder what we don't know yet that people here on our planet, military government, whoever it is, you know, all the people that know the tech twenty years ahead of time. Uh, I was told it's no longer that distance, that it's a lot, uh, that distance is no longer 20 years in advance that they have technology already already there. They said that, that those years have uh, decreased because it just keeps coming so quick, the technology. So, but I wonder what is ahead that they already know, our people, that we don't know yet. It's just absolutely amazing. I, I can't even keep up with what's going on with the internet. I'm having to change, you know, I have my own online business with Blue Rock Talk and, and doing my own live streaming show and the, the, the servers change, the platforms change and, and everybody has to keep up with everybody and it's a constant change. Talk to Joe out of the Bronx. Hey there, Joe. Hey, how are you doing, Connie? I'm good. How's it going? Uh, it's going okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Anthony Sanchez uh, was a uh, an important guest. Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to. Now you mentioned Dulce, and you were there. Um, yeah. What's your speculation on it? My speculation is that it's an interdimensional portal. Well, a portal mm -hmm. uh, that uh, features an alternative reality. And what's your speculation? You know, there's. We all know. Everybody knows Skinwalker Ranch. Um, now, um, what is it, the Bradshaw Ranch? But Comb Keller, one of the guys that work with Bigelow and part of the Skinwalker Ranch, he had told me years ago, he said, Connie, these places are everywhere. Now, I grew up 
with a haunted house and and i i dealt with things all my life in different parts of the world i move around a lot and with radio and tv you kind of move around a lot and these thing these places are everywhere um so dulce is another place with all sorts of stuff happening um when i was there i just know that each time we were run out you know a lot of times you can go to a place and it'll take a while before maybe you get some activity uh or or not but the, the places that, that get activity very quickly you want to keep going back and learning at least at least i do but uh but dulcy man you just, you just want to get out of dodge uh and that's exactly what happened each time there were just so much activity so quickly and to where it was pressured to leave so i i, I don't know you know that i love philip schneider i mean you got to love philip schneider right and his stuff um and you know he talked about that area too and there's just so much information about underground base there and talking about talking with the people that live there and what they say that they see all the time so do i believe in underground bases well i know that i've seen tunnels that we ourselves have made that were unbelievable underground the mega caverns right there in louisville kentucky un real if you just see those man-made unbelievable what philip schneider talked about years ago just talked about like the same kind of thing so do i think there's uh i think there's absolutely a possibility of bases whether they're ours or something else but man i i can't deny philip schneider can you good stuff right are you yeah, still with definitely. me yes what do you think of philip yeah, schneider I'm listening uh, I'm sorry. Do you remember Philip Snyder? Uh, vaguely, but uh, can you elaborate on him? Yeah, he would talk about the underground bases, and he was a foreman, and he was talking about the machines that cut the tunnels, right. uh, and he talked about you know they were he he was upset that they didn't tell us a, that they didn't tell him and his group about the base uh, because as they were creating our bases all of a sudden some aliens fell down boom 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 and there was this shootout and crazy stuff like that you'll have to check him out if you haven't <laughs> well, Connie, what about the denver airport that was rumored yeah. to have underground uh tunnels and bases uh, that were military related yeah so that's not far from me and uh there's a big horse stallion that's there it's got yes at the red eyes and all that kind of thing. So um, the very first time I was ever in the Denver airport, this was years ago, and I knew nothing about the bases at the time uh, or any conversation about that. And when I was in there, I just know I felt really strange. I didn't like it. I didn't know what was going on. I, I saw weird pictures on the wall, uh, strange pictures. And places leading nowhere just, just didn't make sense. That's what I picked up. Then later I heard about the bases. See what we can talk about tonight. Wild card line number five, Ruth. Hey there, Ruth out of Maryland. Mm, I'm a crab lover. I love blue crab. That's my favorite. Yes, Maryland is for crabs. Hi, Connie. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for taking my call. It's the first Thank time you. I've got to talk to you. And I've been really wanting to talk to you because... You know the most about the dog man. And mm. I have a dog man story for you. Um, oh. It's pretty interesting. And I have a comment, a story, and then a question for you. Um, okay. First of all, I personally believe that the dog man is possibly a werewolf, a person that's just so totally possessed that they actually have a metamorphosis. And when I was younger, in my 20s with my first husband, he was kind of very strange, and he would stay up all night, um, and he didn't even sleep upstairs with me in the bedroom, and I don't even know what he was doing at night, what he was getting into or dabbling in, but anyway, one night I heard, I had a lot of animals at the time. I also had two pot belly pigs, I had a pot belly pig, a dog, and some cats, and, <laughs> and anyway, I heard these very loud, loud noises, growling and snarling noises. I mean, it was really 
horrific. And I heard it downstairs, and I knew it wasn't one of my animals. I knew it wasn't any animal that I've ever, ever heard before. So the next morning, I asked him about it. You know, when I, the next day, I, I asked him, I said, what? I said, I heard a bunch of noises down here last night, growling and snarling. I said, what? I said, what, what was going on? What was that or whatever, you know? And he tried to tell me that it was my it was the animals. So I thought, huh, I don't think so. So the next night, I put all the animals in the bedroom with me, all of them. And then I heard it again. I heard the same noises again, the growling and snarling. I wasn't even about to go downstairs to see what, what, what it was. But I definitely heard it. And then this is what's really strange, okay? The next morning, I asked him again, okay, what, what was going on? Don't even try to tell me that it was the animals because they were all in the bedroom with me. And do you know what he said to me, Connie? He looked at me very, very solemnly and said, I don't know, Ruth. He said, I think I was fighting the beast within myself. Ooh. So I just want to know your comments on that and your opinion. Ooh. Oh yeah, it was. Oh. Kind of, I thought you'd probably laugh about that one. Actually. Well, I'm I'm glad he's your ex. <laughs> I, yeah, I see why he's your ex. Years after that to leave him, but yeah. Oh, um, interesting. It's, no, um, you know Paul Sinclair out of the UK. He talks about um, you know, especially the UK people. They 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 know werewolves, you know, and so mm -hmm. he would say dogman and werewolves are the same, and um. Cryptid five five nine, who's been on here before, and is a blue rocker. Yeah, he um, he has actually seen a dog man in front of him and saw the whole body. And he uh, reluctantly, I, I remember asking him the question. He wasn't going to say it at first, but then I had asked him something in reference to if it was wearing anything or something like that. But anyway, he told me he said it had uh, shorts. And they were ripped up shorts. So, uh, you know, we were talking about how it was a man and did that werewolf thing where it metamorphed into metamorphed. something and tore off his clothes. Yeah. So isn't that interesting that there's at least a couple things that kind of mention what you're talking about? However, wow, being married to one? Woo, girl. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm surprised he actually admitted that, that he actually said that to me or whatever, you know? Oh, but, man. Uh, I, 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 I wanted to you about that. I want to throw some Scooby snacks, you know, jokes out. And, you know, did he did he grab for those along the way? Was he eating the dog food once in a while? You know, I want to play around with some jokes, but I won't. Yeah, I'm curious <laughs> what, if I would have came downstairs, what would I would have wow. seen? You know, what I've seen, what you just kind of described, I mean. Yeah, I don't and know. I'm wondering if if you ran into one of these and and if you if they tried to hurt you and you and you killed it, would it turn back to? I guess it would change back to its original human form. Well, man, I, I saw a Michael Jackson video that did something similar to that. Um, you know, you. Uh, I'm glad that you pulled the animals up the second night. Mm -hmm. So that you could differentiate that it wasn't your animals at all. And he was doing something weird to them, too. You know, that's what I'm thinking. Right. But, uh, you know, there's people that say these things are aggressive. Run when you see one. And and if you do see one, it's probably the last thing you see. And then there's a whole bunch of other people that say they are the nicest, kindest teachers in the world, so mm, I don't believe that. After if you if you could hear the the growling and the snarling, no, I don't. I don't believe that at yeah. all. Yeah, wow. I could sense wow. that it was totally evil. Well, they say with the Bigfoot that there's some that are uh, extraterrestrial, and there are some that are not. And uh, you know, I I don't know, but there's another piece of the puzzle we will put down. So thanks for calling right. in. I, I don't believe that... the Bigfoots are the same as a dog man. I think they no. are different. You know. No. They are different, but but the fact that some people say that some are this way and some are that way, that's just like maybe the dog man, some are this way, some are that way too. I think they're all, they seem to all be different. Uh, they seem to all be individualistic behavior wise, but there's some different looking things out there too. Oh my gosh, there's people that see, you know, 
pig man as well. I mean, there's who knows, but you know what? I'm glad you're okay. And thank you for that story and, and the courage to tell it because it's, it's not easy to tell these things when we were talking. Uh, so thanks for your call. It's open lines. Continue to call in everybody. Hey, you want to know how hard it is to get extra work or different work? When you talk about UFOs and Bigfoot for a living, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm raising my hand. I can tell you all about it. So uh, uh, I'm glad that when you guys do call in, it takes a lot of courage to do that. And I appreciate that you give the stories that you do. Let's go west of the Rockies, talk to Michael out of California. Hey there, Michael, you're on the air. Howdy, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? Oh, I'm having... I'm, I've been having a lot of success lately, yeah. um, but I, it's more what you want to know. Because for a lot of your topics, I have data, documentation, and I'm under no oaths of secrecy. Oh, okay. So, for instance, um, I have pictures of the inside of Dolce Labs out of New oh. Mexico. I've How'd you get those? The attacks. Let's just say espionage is a hobby. Okay. And that was half joking, but mainly I like to stay in the loop. And I have contacts that give me huge amounts of information. For instance, on um, one of the NFT platforms today, a dossier containing 460 pages proving the existence of basically not only the secret wealth that funded the Federal Reserve in the first place, but it's coming due and that's what the brick currency thing is happening. No, the dollar won't collapse overnight. It's in phases. But the dossier containing all this information is listed as an NFT right now. Mm. Um, and uh, I, as for me, I'm, I do research. I, I make sound frequencies that are made to alter a person's DNA positive in a positive way. Um, and that's my life's work. However, I like to stay well informed. So what do you want to know? Wow. I like the frequency thing because that's like the answer to everything. I'm, I, it's been a, it's been a real a chore getting it to catch on. Cause I try to make music to heal. For instance, what most people don't know about the vaccine is there's an 18 gigahertz octave frequency. It's a delayed trigger. It doesn't kill somebody immediately. There's a frequency that they can play through the towers. And I'm aware I'm risking myself by saying this on air. Honestly, yeah, so let's, so let's stay know. away. Let's stay away from let's stay away from the political kind of things. Let's go back to the alien UFO kind of stuff so that You'll there be a little a lot safer. More in, in that regard, than people realize. I'm sure. Um, many people are familiar with the Palladians and the like, but then there's the Lyrians. Now, some it's like anything. They're good ETs and bad ETs, but we cannot judge them by our standards. No, they've evolved to a completely different environment. They are not us. Exactly right. They are not us, and people people continue to think like humans when they try to theorize what these are doing. <laughs> so I agree with you. I, I have reincarnated here many times and humanity once had an enlightened state of consciousness. There were 200 individuals of the top echelon in Atlantis that built a pyramid that should have never been built. that was made to enslave people using the Merkaba. Those 200 are re referenced in our modern-day mythology and literature as the 200 original fallen. But, the, but not all the people there were bad. But, that, but we have fallen so far as a species. We, we, we have sort of so far away from where we once were. And I would like to see us regain our former glory. Not pretend we're the most advanced species we've ever been, because that's just not true. So, Michael, um, how can I get you to call in at another time where we can talk with you a lot more? Um, why, don't you, why don't you contact I, I, you me? Have, you have my text. I sent you. Oh, oh. I sent you my email. Oh, okay. 
Okay. I sent Do you that. a bunch of pictures of documents, by the way, in uh, your text. Okay. Line. Okay. Are you under Michael? Under Michael. Okay. Yes. Um, and, yeah, I just um, released a book, Meditations for the Superhuman Mage. Oh. And I would love to do a segment with you. I'm willing to give you full disclosure. And if you look at the text stream associated with our number, you'll see an abnormal number of pictures, some of them inside Dolce Labs, some of Excellent. them of the secret financial documents of the deep state. And you're free to use them however you wish. Okay. So you got you you sent that to me. I sent it to you via text from the same oh. number I'm calling on right now. Oh, well, okay. We'll send it to Connie at ConnieWillis.com. Connie at ConnieWillis.com. An email, right? There you go. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have to let you go here, but thank you for that. I appreciate that. We'll, we'll take a look at what you have and that, cause that sounds like a show. That doesn't sound like a question. That sounds definitely like a show. And I appreciate that. Let's see if we can't grab one quick call before uh, time flies here. Let's go to, let me refresh over here. Cause we got some talk. Oh, let's see. Let's go to um, Brendan wildcard line. Number two, Austin, Texas. Hello. Hey there, you're on the air. Hey, uh, so at the previous lady that had the husband that would turn, Art Bell had on the possessed uh, caller line that we had on the Art Bell vault recently, like if you're an insider, you can go and search that up. There was a caller that called who said that he turns into a beast at night and hides it from his wife. So that might be kind of interesting for you to listen to. But that's not why I called. The reason I called was uh, I'm kind of connecting this pattern. I just wanted to throw it out there to people for other people to comment in on it. I would love somebody else to call and talk about this some other night. But Art Bell lived over an aqueduct, one of the biggest in the whole nation. And Whitley Strieber lives over an aqueduct, one of the biggest in the whole nation. And I also live over the same aqueduct as Whitley Strieber. Connie used to be over here uh, at San Antonio. And the yep. E.T. that I had seen had wet skin. And it makes oh. me think that, uh, like, they're inside of the aquifers, and we have all these cave networks throughout the country. And I just have a very, very strong suspicion that, that they're using the aquifers to settle in. And I had a question for you, Connie, because we're running out of time. Has anybody ever written about military abducting people other than Whitley Strieber? I know he talked about it a little bit, but has there ever been any other authors that talked about military abductions that were similar yeah. to ET abductions? Got to run, Brendan. Sorry I didn't get you earlier. Appreciate you calling in and everybody for open lines. And also uh, thank Anthony Sanchez for for writing in or, or talking with us earlier, too. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.